Gardner River site is a former nuclear weapons plant established in 1951. So one of the neat things about alligators is that they make a really good bioindicator species, which means that we can use alligators to assess the health of the environment. The new hydrogen bomb material plant on the Savannah River in South Carolina is today the most carefully guarded area in the United States. In order to produce nuclear material, you need to have a reservoir. These reservoirs are filled with contaminants, and one of the main animal populations that are known on these reservoirs are American alligators. And it looks like something straight out of a scary movie. So American alligators are a really interesting species. They are modern dinosaurs in my opinion. So an alligator ecotoxicologist is somebody who looks at how alligators and contaminants in the environment interact. In regards to looking at contaminants, alligators are probably one of the best bioindicator species because they're long-lived and they're top predators, which makes them susceptible to accumulating a lot of contaminants over time. Which just means they're ingesting contaminants at a higher rate than which they're potentially excreting them. So anything they're eating or um, even through breathing in in the atmosphere, um, these contaminants can just stick onto muscle tissue. Being at the top of the food chain, these alligators are gonna have the highest levels. So a typical field day for me is I have my boat already waiting for me at um, one of the reservoirs. Um, and so myself and my partner will go out and activate these wooden bait traps. And then first thing in the morning, my team and I go out on an airboat and check these traps. So once we go up to a trap, a few of us will all pull the alligator onto land. And once we get the alligator um, pretty well situated where we need it on land, we'll throw that towel over its eyes. Once its eyes are closed, it's basically defenseless. So one of us will go press its upper jaw down because they have a very weak opening force. So we're able to just go behind it, press its mouth closed. Um, I'll usually come up and tape the mouth and then we're ready to work up the animal. And we'll um, take blood, get body measurements, so total body from the snout to the tip of their tail, um, snout to their vent where they pee and poo, um, head measurements, head length, head width, and tail girth. Isn't she just the best? <laughs> and once we get all the measurements we need, we'll add a pit tag so that we can be able to know whether or not um, we've caught that animal before. And once we get all of that, we're able to take the tape off the mouth and release the animal and we're good to go. Obviously, you have to have your guard up when you're dealing with an animal that if they bite you, they can rip your arm off. At four in the morning, um, our team was getting the samples they needed and we were all very tired and um, I had leaned over to get some data sheets and I was warned on multiple occasions to watch out for that tail, but I did not listen and of course I got smacked right on the back and thrown forward. So once I have the sample, um, I am measuring levels of mercury. So I'm looking at their total mercury contaminant body burden levels um, using the blood and their tail muscle that I collect. Mercury is a neurotoxin, so any type of movement or reaction response behavior mercury can delay. And, th and this behavior could be problematic because it could impact their survival. Um, it could imply that they aren't as successful hunting or seeking shelter. Um, they can put themselves at exposure of getting attacked by another alligator. It'll be neat to see whether or not um, animals that are in adulthood are having these type of responses to contaminant exposure. With adults, usually if they end up making it past a certain point, they're considered to be okay, but that might not necessarily be the case. And one of the interesting things about um, alligators and other crocodilians is their temperature sex determination. So based off of what temperature they're incubated at, um, they can be either male or female. 
And one of the things that could cause an issue for this is the exposure of endocrine disrupting chemicals. And so in the case of these um, alligators that are still in their embryonic stage in an egg, um, there's a chance that the chemicals can end up making their male promoting temperature null and create a female alligator. So another issue with um, temperature sex determination is the implications for climate change because obviously if we are having higher uh, environmental temperatures, that's going to mean a difference in incubation temperatures for these alligators. And so if we only have higher temperatures, there is a chance that we could have a female bias in the future. And once again, that could create a huge drop in genetic diversity for alligators. All the research being done at the Savannah River site, including my own, is a pretty informative case study for how um, contaminants in the environment interact with wildlife. I know our research has been um, also paralleled with stuff being done at Chernobyl. So in order for us to find the solutions to be able to conserve and preserve different species of animals, there has to be science and research done. Our work is definitely more research-based, trying to figure out what the problem is and target what the problem is. And then from there, we can figure out how to mitigate these problems and how to preserve and conserve different species. I'd love to be optimistic and say that humans will stop polluting. I'm hopeful that humans will do better and make more energetically efficient and sustainable choices, but there is a lot of work that still needs to be done.